about uh, 75 in the audience live, but we have many more who are watching this via a live stream on the internet. What is SLU? Well, the word SLU is not an acronym. Many people think that that S-L-O-O-H stands for something. The name SLU comes from the word SLU, S-L-E-W, which is a movement of a telescope to indicate that it is making that style of movement. But it was modified to O-O-H to express, express pleasure and surprise. Mm. Creative, SLU. SLU is a membership organization for amateur astronomers, also called citizen scientists, to explore, imagine, learn, and connect. Doesn't that sound like the library? <laughs> explore, imagine, learn, and connect. SLU is actually a robotic telescope service that allows members to have access to beautiful telescopes in the Canary Islands and in Chile. And you, they get access through their browser to these telescopes with a, with a very small membership fee. It's pretty amazing. SLU's headquarters is in Hartford. Now, you may wonder how this event came to be. About a year ago, SLU CEO, Michael Paolucci, asked if we might be interested in applying for a grant. And the grant was for creating a piece of software that would collect data that amateur scientists got when they were studying asteroids, and this software would take that data and make it usable by NASA. Well, I knew right away we didn't have anybody on the library staff that was going to write that software. <laughs> However, because we got a grant about two years, oh no, a little over a year ago, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we had hired a maker in residence, Ed Kalin, who's here tonight, who did um, an, an open public experiment creating Raspberry Pi all sky view cameras. And I knew as the MIT grad and also as the co-founder of the Fairfield County Makers Guild that he probably could do it. And he came to the meeting and sure enough not only did he work with Mike and Space Gambit and a person from Hawaii who was involved in this, um, they got the grant for $14,000 and he's writing the software um, to interface with NASA. But during that great conversation it was decided that wouldn't it be nice to have a live SLU event from the library? And so th it, that idea was hatched that day. So it's my pleasure to inter introduce to you our host. Now, if you are an astronomer, you, this man does not need an introduction. But I know there are many of you in the audience, like me, who are not citizen scientists. So I'm going to do a, a smaller introduction. He has an incredible resume. But Bob Berman... Um, has authored more than a thousand published articles in national magazines. He's been a guest on such TV shows as Today and Late Night with David Letterman. And he's written eight popular books. And one of them, we were just upstairs looking at the makerspace, and one of them was displayed, and it's The Sun's Heartbeat, which is very relevant for the winter solstice. And that one is upstairs um, on display with other winter solstice books. That's the most important one. Mm -hmm. um, he has a new book called Zoom, How Everything Moves from Atoms and Galaxies to Blizzards and Bees, published by Little Brown. And it's currently the Amazon number one bestseller in geophysics. For the past, past decade, he has been the chief astronomer for SLU, this community observatory. Since 1989, Bob is a popular monthly columnist in the magazines Discover and Astronomy. Listeners in seven states hear his Sky Window program on on the Northeast Public Radio stations during NPR's weekend edition. Bob founded the Catskill Astronomical Society in 1976, the Storm King Observatory at Cornwall, New York, and Overlook Observatory near Woodstock, New York. And he was adjunct professor of astronomy and physics at Marymount College from 1995 to 2000. Bob lectures for innumerable academic and federal entities and as a slew live commentator, and also does large expeditions three times a year to celestial events such as auroras and also total eclipses. He has spent five years overseas from the Arctic to the Antarctic and is known for his unique blend of humor, mm. informality, and encyclopedic knowledge. Please join me in welcoming Bob Berman and SLU. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I appreciate that uh, generous introduction, even if I did write most of it myself, actually. 
Uh, this is very special because in the olden days, as many of you know, uh, just uh, these people I was just speaking to have just been to Stonehenge, and I don't have to tell you that Stonehenge is exemplative of the of the uh, the cultural celebrations of the solstice through the centuries, through the millennium. It was. Uh, it was a big, big deal, not just because people had more time on their hands than they do today, but because, well, we'll talk about why, because, but it's fallen into um, kind of disuse, if that's the right word. Um, part of it is that some of those celebrations involved things that would be illegal today or frowned on, like animal sacrifices or throwing your in-laws from, from the tops of pyramids and things like that. It would violate municipal ordinances today. Nonetheless, uh, come on in, plenty of seats. At a certain point, I do this mischievous thing that really late comers, just as they come in, I say, and that's the most important thing that we're going to, that you're going to hear today. And they feel, oh, what did I miss? I'll try to uh, keep myself from doing that. So around the world, this has been a celebration. Uh, Mayans and monuments... But uh, people don't do that anymore. Part of the reason is that knowledge of the sky has fallen into uh, disuse, I guess uh, it'd be one way to say it. You know, every farmer 100 years ago, 200 years ago, could have told you which way the sun moves or the moon moves across the sky. But ask your friends today, uh, well, here's one, try this out. As the sun is setting, like today it's setting as far to the left as it ever does, today on the solstice. But as it sets, does it set straight down? That would be choice A. Down and to the left or down and to the right? Now, from experience, I know that about a third of the people today get that right, down and to the right. Most people get that wrong. But 200 years ago, everybody would have answered that. Now, despite more people than ever uh, going to college, graduating from college today, people are not sky aware. I don't know if it's because we don't pay attention to nature, because this stuff isn't classroom stuff. It has to do with um, being observant. Maybe it's that the cities are so bright and that we no longer get to see the sky the way they used to. Whatever the reason is, we don't really pay attention to things in the sky. So what we're doing, and I hope this is the first of many, because SLU, this is its 10th anniversary, with the uh, sudden ability to bring the universe to everybody, to every home and to every computer, what we're doing today is bringing the sun, because solstice is from two Latin words, sun, and stoppage, solstice. Because today is the day that the sun stops moving south. And when does that happen? During this uh, program. It'll happen at three minutes after six. And so what we're bringing you here are live views of the sun. Of course, the sun isn't out here. This is over the horizon. But that's what SLU is able to do, bring live views via either our giant telescopes in the Canary Islands or in Chile, or uh, partner telescopes. This one's coming from uh, Australia. You can even see some little clouds going by just for authenticity. And uh, there's some storms on the sun. Yeah, we'll lower the lights. And so while we look at the sun, during this uh, hour, and we'll take questions and answers for the final 15 minutes or more of it, we'll talk about the solstice, w upcoming amazing things involving events on the sun that we're going to cover at SLU and that you can see just from your backyards. We'll talk about the sun itself because never has there been a time when uh, the discoveries are just pouring in at a rate previously only seen in science fiction. And uh, about some of the things about the sun, uh, light and color, because that's how we know about the universe. The sun is what supplies us with uh, our ability to see. Our eyes were designed to see by just those wavelengths that the sun emits most strongly. In other words, the sun doesn't put out x-rays or gamma rays. It does in its core, but not that comes out of the surface. We're going to learn about some of the strange, odd, weird things about the sun. There's a little sun inside the sun that we didn't know about until about 15 years ago. 
So we'll celebrate the sun and the solstice. Here's an old book about the sun. This will really illustrate the point. Written about 75 years ago. What did we know about the sun back then? Back then, all it, all it could say is the sun was hot. All we know is that there was fire on the sun. It was hot. All right. But now we found out in 1920 that the inside of the sun, a little innermost five hundredth of the sun, one five hundredth of the sun, a little ball that's only 22% from the center on outward, is the uh, core of the sun. And that's where it really produces all of its heat and light and everything that uh, sustains life. And all the rest of the sun just uh, lets it pass through. And it escapes from a thin layer on the surface of the sun. It's so thin that it's only 200 miles thick. It's like it's painted on. So when you see that bright sun, and you know you can see it when there's a little bit of clouds uh, just slightly blocking it, uh, I think you can let those people in. Uh, you know, there's some people who are hesitant to come in. They're being shy because they're criminally late. Um, and so all the, everything radiates from that. When you, when you look at the sun, it looks so sharp. It looks sharp-edged, and that's because it's a very, very thin veneer that actually radiates the brightness, only 200 miles thick. And that's not even the most interesting thing. As I said, there's the core that really gives off, at first, uh, X-rays and gamma rays, very little visible light, relatively speaking. In fact, the heart of the sun is as black as coal. The center of the sun is pitch black to our eyes. But we found that 70% of the way out from the center of the sun, there's a boundary that we had no idea that it exists. This is the sun inside the sun that I was talking about. Just as we've learned that there's an Earth inside our planet Earth. Remember when we went to school? Not that I want to put you all in my uh, age pool, but they used to teach us that the center of the Earth had a liquid iron core. Remember that? A lot of you were nodding, so... So I guess you did, but beep, that's been changed. Now we know that the center of the Earth is a tiny solid ball the size of the, the poor, demoted planet Pluto. And it spins faster than the rest of Earth. So we have, it's like we have an Earth inside our planet Earth that spins a little faster than the rest of our planet that we hadn't suspected. And just like that, we've just learned that the innermost 70% of the sun is a different kind of sun. I mean, this is beyond that innermost 22%, which is the fusion core. 70%, the innermost 70% spins as if it were a solid ball, a solid rubber ball. And from that point out, the sun spins chaotically, where the equator takes about a month and the poles take a about a week longer than that to rotate. So it's a, a, a strange differential spin where areas rub against other areas. And all that starts 70% of the way out from the center, inside of which everything is just solid and spins uniformly. So that boundary is called the Taco Climb. And that's where the sun's magnetism is generated. That's where all the juicy stuff starts when we see those nuclear fires, those geysers, those pink geysers of flame that come out of the sun, that has its origin in that spot of the sun, that region of the sun that we never even knew existed. We've also found out that the sun pulses rapidly. A whole field called helioseismology is based on the rapid pulsations up and down like a giant subwoofer. And by studying those, we know what's under the surface, just as uh, seismologists here on Earth can uh, figure out what is producing and where they're produced, the uh, earthquakes. So it's a fabulous time to be into the sun and studying the sun. We have an armada of spacecraft with names like Stereo and Source and Soho and Trace and Ace and SDO that are constantly going around the sun and showing us the far side of the sun and all these other things. So, uh, plus, what is its effect on weather and climate? But we're going to back up and do some explorations of light and color, and we're going to keep bringing you live images. You know, the solstice is ticking down. What will happen on the solstice? Will everything, will the room shake or something like that? 
That's why I dressed in black. This is not, not because the Jets lost today. This is because this is the darkest day. So uh, we will continue to bring you, there it is, live pictures from Australia where the sun is shining. There are some giant storms. Each of those are larger than on planet Earth. And uh, uh, to show you the sun on the salsa. So let's talk even before we get into that. I'm gonna, I want to make sure this, we have time to do this. So I'm going to pass by something that's in the sun's family in the solar system. And that is this kind of dark, unattractive rock. If somebody, I, I, I asked this of the kids here, if somebody gave you a choice of this pretty gold rock to keep, I'm not giving that actual choice, but it's theoretical, or this kind of grungy looking one, which do you think you'd want to keep? They're both half iron. The di that's right, because although they're half iron, this is half iron, half sulfur. I'll bet a lot of you kids even know what this is. What is this? Pyrite, fool's gold, right. And this fell in South America 150 years ago after traveling through the solar system for four billion years. It's a piece of an asteroid. There are thousands of asteroids. And anytime you see a meteor in the night sky, if it makes it to the ground, it's a piece of an asteroid, except for the 50-odd pieces that came from the moon or Mars. Almost all of them are asteroid chunks, whereas meteor showers, like the kind that we brought you at SLU, because if you have cloudy weather, we still have low-light video cameras that'll bring the meteor showers anyway. We just had the great Geminids on the night of December 13th the 14th, and the Ursids. Um, um, coming up, those never make it to the ground because they're just bits of comet. They're too uh, flimsy. But Connecticut is the place where more homes have been impacted than anywhere else. This is ground zero for the ones that really do come in. Actually, it wasn't that far away from Connecticut, Peekskill. I'll almost redraw the lines and count that, where on October 9th, 1992, a young woman, a 20-year-old woman, Michelle Knapp, heard a loud crunch from her driveway and rushed out, and it was her car, her beloved first-ever car, that was uh, totally crushed in by a meteorite about this big that had gone through the trunk and onto the ground. She thought it was a vandal at first. Would have had to be a pretty strong vandal to throw a rock right through the car. Maybe vandals are stronger in that part of the world. But police came, firemen came, eventually they found it was a meteorite. I can tell you the cars, the insurance didn't cover that. <laughs> and it was a 10-year-old car, so the, the warranty certainly didn't cover that. But as so often happens in life, what started out as a seemingly bad or sad event proved otherwise because a collector offered her $69,000 for the meteorite, uh, which she accepted. He wanted the car also, and she figured, hey, 10-year-old Malibu, take it. <laughs> and that was in 1992. Ten years earlier, 1982, November of that year, in Weathersfield, here in your state, you probably know about this because it was so famous, Bob and Wanda Donahue had been watching TV in one room. I asked them what show. They said, MASH. When they heard the loudest sound they'd ever experienced coming from the next room, so they rushed in, and there was a hole in the ceiling and dust was filling the air and the furniture was knocked over and there were scuff marks on the rug. This showed them that when the meteorite came through the ceiling, it hit the carpet, bounced back up again and then bounced down again. Took a few bam, bam, bam bounces. And uh, they got to keep it, eventually uh, donated it to a museum in New Haven. And then, and this is really weird, the last time before that, that a house had been struck any time in America, was 11 years earlier, April of 71, and the home uh, that time was in Weathersfield, same town. So what are the chances of the same town being hit twice in a row by meteorites? You know, the only explanation is that this is, you know, just outside of Hartford where all the insurance companies are, you know. <laughs> You know, all the actuaries live there. These are the people that study the chances of things happening. That's why it happened to them. 
So these things really happen. Uh, don't go looking around for meteorites on the ground. You're not likely to find, find them. I should have looked up how many have been found in Connecticut's history. I know 12 have been found in all of New York State's history. So if you do find one, first of all, pass around an earthly rock for comparison, one that has a lot of iron in it. And then um, here's the meteorite, and also pass by a magnet, because if you are wondering whether it's a real meteorite, uh, almost all of them will be pulled by a magnet. So that's your first clue. Another one is look for it, especially kids, when you look at it, notice it's got little dimples in the rock that as if they were soft mud, if you stuck your thumb in, they'd make little thumbprints, and that's what they're called sometimes, thumbprints. The technical term is regmaglips. Glips, Y-P-T-S. Strange Scrabble ending, regmaglips. So there is that. We'll pass that around together so you all can see what a genuine something from the Suns family is. Notice we're continuing to bring you live slew views of the sun. I'm keeping an eye on the clock so that we don't miss the solstice. This can be one of those bonding experiences, even though this particular group finding ourselves together in a room, again, is unlikely. But it's sort of like an old Lang Syne, uh, New Year's Eve kind of thing. This is with a filter. Look at the solar prominences coming off the bottom of the sun right now. See that again, the size of Earth. Those geysers of nuclear flame. You can see those for yourself if you go to a total eclipse of the sun. I'll also be talking about the upcoming solar eclipses. You don't want to miss them. They are life-changing. You know, people sometimes tell you about a great movie they've seen and, oh, you got to see this, and uh, half the time it's been built up too much and you're, you're disappointed, but this is a case where it always exceeds expectations. And after a long hiatus, 38 years in the United States without a total eclipse, we're finally going to have a couple coming up where you don't have to leave the country. So you definitely want to see it. That's your, that's your opportunity to see flames actually coming out of the sun and the stars coming uh, visible in the daytime. And uh, it's not just the animals that go crazy. People weep. And once you've seen them, people take out second mortgages and do whatever they, they have to do to get under the uh, sun shadow again. And it's rare because a total solar eclipse only happens once every 360 years for any given location. If you want to be a stay-at-homer, that's how long you have to wait. The last one around here was on January 24th, 1925. And we're not going to get another one if you want to be a stay-at-homer until uh, May 1st of uh, 2079. And even that's beating the odds because that's only half the time you usually have to wait. So you definitely want to, when you hear about the eclipses coming up, and I'll give you the dates in a little bit, uh, don't just say you're going to stay uh, home and just see it because it's good enough. It's a partial eclipse. It's 90% eclipse. Don't want to sound snooty about it, but the difference between a, even a 99% eclipse and a total eclipse is the difference between the, the whole thing, all, all the phenomena, or not seeing it at all. 99% you still need eye protection. Otherwise, it'll hurt your eyes. With a total solar eclipse, you can look right at it. Even use binoculars, perfectly safe. And imagine that, flames coming out of the edges of the sun and stars coming out in the middle of the daytime. You know, it's a phenomenal thing. I wonder if anybody here, just by a show of hands, has ever seen a total solar eclipse. So you look around, nobody. Once in a while, you'll get somebody in the audience saying, well, I think so. That would be like a woman saying, uh, I think I once gave birth. I'm not sure. <laughs> and it's, it's one of these things that you would know if you've been there. So just in case, I, after all the build-up that I forgot to tell you, uh, the next time coming up here in America will be August 21st, 2017. It'll be a coast-to-coast -coast totality, sweeping from the Pacific Northwest to the uh, southeastern states. I think it'll be best seen around um, Wyoming and Idaho 
And you'll see maps of it a year and a half or so ahead of time. So just get into that 100 mile wide path. Make sure you do that because just outside of you're going to miss it. And you need eye protection. If you look at it without eye protection, you can hurt your eyes. In, on May 10th, 1994, we had such a deep partial eclipse right here. And I was on the radio that day warning people, actually the day before, not to look at it without eye protection. And a woman called the station and said, um, if the eclipse is so dangerous, why are they having it? So you want to go to a place where you don't even need uh, uh, eye protection at all. We're going to have that, and then just seven years later, it's been 38 years since the last totality anywhere in America. That was February 26th of 1979. Now we're going to have one on April 8th, uh, 2024. And that time the shadow will go north from Texas, and then over Cleveland, Buffalo, Rochester, reasons to go to Buffalo, and Rochester... And my wife went there, you, uh, you beast. I, I never can say anything bad about Buffalo. And then uh, even pass to the northeast over uh, Burlington. So that'll be not even that far away. And then we're back waiting a long time again, August 11th, 2045, till the next one over America. So you can see how it works. They're, they're hard to see. They're, um, they're, they're rare but tremendous events. And that's probably the most interesting thing I'm going to tell you today. <laughs> well, sit anywhere. There's chairs. Um, okay, as we count down, now it's just a matter of minutes to the solstice. Let's go back from uh, the, what we've been talking about, which are the most astonishing events you're going to see coming up in the next few years, to uh, the solstice, which is happening today. If you ask most people about wh what makes the salsa special, they'll get it right, pretty much, because it's our last remaining link between the earth and the sky. You know, there was a time when holidays revolved around it. Now we have a few religious holidays, Easter, for example, uh, a few Jewish holidays, certainly some Muslim holidays that revolve around the full moon, but by and large we ignore the sky. But this is one of those. Salsa, kids don't get off from school for it. But nonetheless, it's special. I ask most people, well, what is it about it? They'll say, first day of winter. Yeah, winter is going to begin now in about four minutes from now. Okay, that's it. We know it's the shortest day, shortest hours of daylight. But you know what most people don't realize is that there's a reliable yearly sequence that goes like this. Our darkest experiential day happened two weeks ago on Pearl Harbor Day on December 7th. That's when we have our darkest afternoon meaning our earliest sunset. And since more people are awake at around sunset late afternoon than they are at five or six in the morning, so far as what people experience, the darkest, gloomiest part of winter already happened. Happened two weeks ago. And by now, we have several more um, minutes of afternoon brightness. The brightness is growing in the afternoon, and it has been for two weeks. Think good, optimistic stuff. Then today is the shortest uh, day, longest night. And then two weeks from now, the first week of January, we have our darkest morning. See, after today, sun rises, still continue getting earlier and earlier. And those mornings still continue to get darker till the first week of uh, January. And then that starts brightening up too. So that's the sequence. Then in Groundhog Day is the midpoint of winter traditional. That was Candlemas, the old, we're talking about mythology and celebrations and civilizations that are, that have been into the uh, solstice since forever. Candlemas was always celebrated right around February 2nd. They didn't have any marmots or groundhogs or mammals or shadows, but nonetheless, that was always a big celebration day. People who just came in, we we're looking at live views of the sun brought to you by SLU the community observatory. We have uh, partners around the world and telescopes around the world that bring you live astronomy and astronomy events. And I'm hoping, I'm expecting that this will be the first of celebrations of equinoxes and solstices that will bring back the old tradition. Not, we're not doing the drums, 
the animal sacrifices, the throwing the in-laws from the, from the, from the pyramids. I assume it was in-laws. You know, they always said they sacrificed people, but how did they, how did they choose who to sacrifice? You know, human nature. W- would it be their favorite people? Probably not. It's probably the most annoying people in the tribe. <laughs> but what else happens on the uh, equinox? Okay, here are the little lesser-known things. The uh, sun moves through the sky in its most curving path today. That is... The, uh, if you did a time-lapse photograph, you'd see that instead of the sun moving through the sky in a straight line the way it does on the equinoxes, if you face the sun, it has a very curving path. It goes up and to the right, and it's concave towards the south. So if you face the south, it's a path that looks like this, like a rainbow-type path across the sky. It's also the day when the sun is lowest at noon, today, although that's changing over time. little known event is that it's getting less low over time because Earth's axis is getting less tilted. We're on our way towards a less tilting axis, which is one reason that uh, climate is moderating, glaciers and ice ages are becoming less pronounced even if we didn't meddle with them in any way. The uh, event is happening in the constellation in front of the stars. The sun is right now in front of the stars of Sagittarius. It used to be in front of the stars of the constellation Capricornus, which is why the sun is said to be in Capricornus astrologically. And that's why the line on Earth where the sun is straight overhead today is the Tropic of Capricorn. By all rights, they should pull down those signs. Actually, there's probably no signs up at all saying Tropic of Capricorn. But if there was, they should change them to Tropic of Sagittarius, because that's the way it is today. It's also a time where a lot of cultures have different mythologies. This is it. This is the minute of the solstice. This is it. Three minutes after six. Happy solstice, everybody. (laughs) Happy solstice. (laughs) There it is. I could really get corny and say, introduce yourself to your neighbor. I could do things like at AA meetings. How do I know? I've never been to an AA meeting. But uh, we we did it. We celebrated it. So there's all different mythologies. uh, And and actually, it's good that we're now on the north side of the uh, solstice because one of the myths is that in India, they believe that the six-month period that begins with the solstice is the best time for spiritual advancement, that it's easier to meditate and get closer to the divinity uh, during this six-month period when the sun is moving northward in the sky than the other half of the year. So it just began. What we should have done is held a a yoga and meditation session right after this. So there's all sorts of things. Again, there is the sun live. This is so cool. I think this is so cool that we're doing the solstice and we're using today's technology to do a very, very ancient thing that they used to have to do with stones and they didn't have you know, many tools and stuff to do. But let me branch on from this to the light that's so important with the, um, with the sun. Oh, those, for the people who came in later. Yes, the sun. Here's an old book about the sun. Everybody likes this. But saying that the sun is hot, or should I not even do that? <laughs> our, I, our vision, okay, for, uh, at the end, our vision is built around the sun. That is, nature designed our eyes so that we see just those wavelengths that the sun gives out most strongly. Sun gives out very few x-rays and gamma rays, and we're blind to them. So whether we were looking for a sandwich or our, our underwear or anything, It would have been foolish to be able to have the ability to see x-rays because they're not visible in x-rays. Instead, what the sun's biggest emission is, you'd think it would be something esoteric, something geeky like ultraviolet or something like that. No, the sun puts out green light more than anything else. That's its peak emission. And sure enough, our eyes are maximally sensitive to green light. And the proof of that is when you see a little spectrum of something on the wall, a prism of glass casts a spectrum on the wall, the green is always going to look brightest. And in twilight, when the colors start fading and our eyes switch over 
to their dim light machinery, all the colors disappear. And you can see this. If you have red socks at night and you throw them on the floor when you're, when you're uh, about to go to bed, this is not a group that has red socks, is it? <laughs> you got red socks. Okay, good, red socks. And then you throw... I don't know if they throw them on the floor either, this group. Okay, <laughs> but let's say theoretically, let's say you threw your socks on the floor and you've turned off the lights and all you have is a um, nightlight. And you start being able to see by the nightlight. You'd see that you know, it doesn't look red anymore. It looks gray. But if it looked green, if it were green socks, you might still be able to perceive it because we can see green in light levels where we can see nothing else. That's one reason why muni municipalities are painting fire engines green. Remember when we were kids, toy fire engines were always red? And now more and more communities have green fire engines because that's what we see best at night. That's why all of the inter, uh, interstate highway signs were chosen to be green, because of our eyes sensitivity to that color. We have a lot of quirks too. For example, yellow probably doesn't exist as a color. We have three types of sensors in our eyes, red, green, and blue. None for yellow. So we create yellow when red and green are mixed together. I'll kind of prove it. Here, take a look at these colors. Shine them on. This, believe it or not, is, is the founder of the company. So I'm doing this in front of the boss. <laughs> so, see, red and green. Now, what will happen when I combine them? I'm going to take the red light and the green light and where I mix them together, see if you can see any yellow. Ready? Yeah. And that's the only way our eye produces yellow, by mixing together um, green and blue. So there may really not be anything, uh, an, an actual thing called yellow, but just um, red and green. I'm going to show you another demonstration of it. Let's take some yellow light. And you all see this is yellow? Now, if I move it fast enough, you might be able to see that it's really red and green. See if you can see the red and green components in it. You see that? So this is what our eyes do. And it has all sorts of quirks to it. For example, the sun. And again, we're looking at the sun live as we celebrate the, the solstice today with uh, SLU, the Community Observatory. If we... Um, the sun looks... Well, what color? Those kids here. When they, and when you were a kid and somebody handed you a box of crayons and you wanted to de depict the sun, what color did you use? Yellow. yellow, right? And yet high altitude balloonists and astronauts tell us that the sun is actually as white as snow. So why this yellow appearance? And the answer, this is amazing, has to do with the blue sky. Because we didn't get that blue sky for free. That blue light is part of the sun spectrum. The sun puts out all the colors of the rainbow, but on its way to us, the blue light going through our atmosphere gets scattered because blue waves are just the right size to hit and be scattered by the atmosphere. So because of that, a lot of the blue from the sun doesn't make it to us, but gets scattered to give us the blue sky. So what remains when we look at the sun itself, it's heavier on the green and on the red part of the spectrum because it's missing some of its blue. And we've already said that green and red combined produce yeah. yellow. So what I'm saying is that the yellow sun and the blue sky go together. They create each other. You can't have one without the other. What's cool is if you want to see the true color of the sun, any day that the, I hate to use the word, but it's coming up, you see snow on the ground on a clear day, Check out snow on a clear day, and what's happening is that the yellowish sun is hitting the snow, and the bluish sky, the blue sky is hitting the snow, so they're recombining. So the color of snow on a clear day is the true color of the sun. The, the, the sun that astronauts see, the actual uh, visible thing. And as for white light, white is always the consequence of uh, seeing the three primary colors of light. And I'm going to shake the white also, and let's see if you can see that it's red, green, and blue this time. Can you see it? Any other colors are just gravy. It doesn't make things any, any whiter. 
So white's just the result of that. And there's lots of visual quirks. For example, there's a favorite color, and how do you know I won't make this up? I'm going to whisper it to my boss. I'm going to tell him the name of the color. I'm going to turn this off so you can hear it. And, okay. So I'm going to give you a choice of colors. Tell me what you're attracted to, because surveys show that adults have a preference for one color more than others. So, in fact, could you press this button here, point that up there, because I don't have three hands. The tail. Aren't we, don't we miss our tails? I wonder why we lost our tails. Because... Um, if there is ever an evolutionary, you know, thing that, that, uh, that we could use, you know, to hold wrenches and things like that. <laughs> okay, here we go. Shine it right next to this. Let's put the three together like a triangle. Okay, red, green, and blue. Now I'm going to ask you as a survey, take to, uh, raise your hand if you're most attracted to the red. Okay. Now raise your hand if you're most attracted to the green. Okay, look around, everybody. See, you see it. And now raise your hand if you're most attracted to the blue. What did I say? Blue? Blue. Blue. There's all sorts of interesting color quirks. So it all starts and comes out with the sun. But then when light gets dim, a funny thing happens that people aren't really very aware of. We switch, our eyes switch to a different kind of film. Oh, film. Film was something that used to be used in photography. It came in these rolls. <laughs> you remember that film? Then you'd have to take it somewhere, take it to a store and wait days and you'd get pictures back. Or I switched to a different kind of machinery, different kind of film in low light. And because we're so used to it, we don't pay any attention to it. Number one, it's colorblind. So that when you turn that light off in your bedroom, and only a little light is coming through the um, curtains or from a night light. You look around the room and everything is gray. It's black and white. You see no more colors. Like those red socks, they just look gray. Two, our low light vision is blurry. The sharpest it ever gets is 2200. That's the legal limit of being blind. So what I'm saying is that when we're taking a walk by moonlight, or out at night, or if you're a backyard amateur astronomer, you're legally blind. Everything looks blurry, and proof of that is just look around the room. You can see that every little detail in the wood of your wood floor is now it's just a blur. Or if you could see every fiber in the carpet when the bright light was on, once you turn it off and you get your night vision, now it's all just blurry. 2200. That's the second quality. Even though there's 20 million of the little rod-shaped cells that give us our so-called scotopic vision, our low-light vision, compared to the six million cone-shaped cells that give us our uh, bright light or photopic vision. Beautiful vision. This light that we're having right now in bright light, three times sharper than our 1080p high-definition TV sets. It's a great vision. But in low light, it really gets crummy vision. Third defect is it doesn't work right away. It has to, these cells need repeated stimulation to work at all. And that's why when you turn off your main light in your room, first you don't see anything. Everything's pitch black. And only after a while can you start seeing a little bit of detail because it, it, it needs time to get going. Fourth defect is a big hole straight ahead, twice the size of the moon, because there are no rod-shaped cells straight back. Now, it's true there's a blind spot in our bright light vision, but the blind spot of one eye never corresponds to the blind spot of another. So we never see a hole anywhere. Plus, it's a tinier blind spot. But with our dim light vision, there's a giant straight-ahead blind spot. Astronomers are used to dealing with this by using what's called averted vision. We pay attention to what we want to look at, but we really look off to the side a little bit to see anything. Next, we can't see deep reds with that. It's not that they just turn gray. You can't see them at all, even as grays, in low light. There's, all, there's even other things. So there's, it's a really poor type of different vision produced by a totally different mechanism. So all of these things initially derived 
from the sun. Again, and for people who are joining us, this is being globally broadcast. Welcome people around the world who are watching this, not just our great audience here in Westport, Connecticut. Um, we are celebrating the sun, looking at live pictures of the sun on this day of the solstice. During this session, the solstice has now uh, come and gone. There are even some far out um, concepts. I'm hesitant to even bring them up. I live near Woodstock, so they sound very Woodstocky. <laughs> but Dr. Roy Bishop, a, a noted physicist in Canada, keeps writing about this, so I'm, so I'm in good company. It's this. Where are these images taking place? Here at SLU, we're bringing you live pictures of the universe, but when you're looking at the front of the room, we're all assuming that all of this is outside your body in the external world, that you're looking out at the external world. But if you look in textbooks, it'll show you that there seems to be three places that vision happens. One, in the back of your eye. You know, the lens focuses two separate upside-down images. You know that from school. Secondly, in the back of the brain, mostly the occipital lobe, one trillion synapses and over 10 billion neurons are devoted to perceiving the visual image. Perception is important. Um, George Berkeley, for whom the campus and the uh, town were named, loved to say that the only things we can perceive are our perceptions. And only, we only assume there's an external universe that corresponds with those perceptions. So what I'm saying is there seems to be three different visual worlds. One, the world we perceive in our brains. Secondly, the thing in our eyes on our retinas. And third, the external world. But we only have one visual image, this. So which is that? We don't see triplets. Which is this? Is this outside your body? Or is this the thing that's happening in your brain? Well, what they will tell you, physiologists will tell you, is this actually is the inside of your brain. Hard to believe. I know you think that's outside your body, that your body ends with your fingertips. But actually, those aren't your real fingertips. That's just your your mind's perception or the feelings that you get of your fingertips, this is no farther from the inside of your brain than your fingers are. So everything visual that's happening is being constructed. What is the real universe? Sun produces all these photons. What would it be like if we weren't here? You know, that old tree falls in the forest business. The answer is that light from the sun, red light here or this light here, has no color or brightness because light, we have learned, are pulses of magnetism and at right angles to them, pulses of electricity. You can't see magnetism and you can't see electricity. So the actual visual world is colorless, black, blank. What's actually in the visual world when we or no other animals are looking at there is blankness. And I'm not saying the kind of philosophical college-type dorm room thing that, oh yeah, of course, you have to see it in order to see it. No, I'm saying it really doesn't have any brightness or color. That we are necessary for the colors and the brightness. In other words, the observer and the universe are correlative. We go together. That what you're seeing visually and what we bring to you at SLU are all part and parcel. Nature and the observer are like a matrix that go together. This is far out stuff. I won't belabor the point, but I can actually see from the number of people that are nodding, either to humor me or, or uh, but I think, uh, I think you get it in this audience. But all right, let's move on from there. For people who joined us back at home, around the world, what we've been doing in this hour now, 40, 50 minutes old, is we've celebrated the solstice, looked at some of the events that are happening, the reasons why cultures throughout history have uh, celebrated this. This is the time when things change. This wasn't a happy time, you know, for the colonists and the Native American tribes. This is a time of hardship. You know, where are the sm nice smells of, of uh, spring and summer and the colors of the flowers and the sounds of birdsong? You know, this is a time of hardship and deprivation and no food growing. It was tough to get through the winter. So marking the time when we finally reached that extreme of darkness, 
which just happened 15 minutes ago. It was very important. And also, they saw it as greater uh, mysteries that were beyond them. These days, we try to solve the mysteries, you know, the Big Bang Theory and all the rest. Back in the time of the Greeks, they thought it was hopeless, you know. And it didn't even bother them. You know, they'd drink their wine and they'd say, ah, nobody knows, and they'd laugh and it was no problem. But they still celebrated it because it was something majestic and something deep and something beyond themselves and beyond their lives. So I'm really honored, it's really a pleasure to have SLU now start to bring these great events involving the, uh, the sun and the sky to more and more of the public. And I wonder if we have any other images to share with them, Mike. Do we have any other live slew things other than this Australian feed, just to give them an idea of what our telescopes or our members are doing, or no? Uh, no. no, we don't. <laughs> See, that proves that this is a live, spontaneous event, that we didn't plan any of this ahead of time. Okay, so what I, I think I'm going to do now is uh, take questions, and feel free to I was going to say there was no such thing as a stupid question, but I've already proven earlier that that's not true. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You can't top them, some of those. So uh, feel free. Any area of astronomy, SLU, or anything else? Uh, yes, sir? I have a question about the image that we're seeing now. Oh, I mean, we're going to have a microphone for you so the people all over the world can see it. Don't feel intimidated by the fact that people are hearing you all around the world with this. Not for a minute. Um, <laughs> The image we're seeing now, there are two circular uh, pieces on the top. But earlier, when the actual solstice happened, there was maybe it was another camera, but the two images that we see on the top were on the bottom. Can you explain why that happened? Yeah. In, in, in real life, as you know, there's no up or down in space. And that, in fact, what we're seeing is the uh, obverse of what people in Australia are seeing because they're upside down from us. And telescopes, astronomical telescopes, traditionally flip the image. Now at SLU, what we traditionally do is, even if the telescope does that, we flip it back so that the view matches what the eye would see with north up. But our partners, first of all, they're in Australia, they're upside down, and they may or may not be flipping the image, and they may be using different uh, equipment or eyepieces or telescopes, so you could be getting it uh, upside down from that. Those dots there are huge storms that are that are part and parcel of this being um, year two of the solar max. We've been waiting for a long, long time with this, and it's been an extraordinary sunspot cycle. You've heard the rumor that the sun goes through an 11-year cycle, but this time the minimum was deeper than anyone alive has ever seen. And instead of being 11 years, it was 14 years. And instead of the sunspot activity increasing normally, it just increased somewhat. So we've been in an extended period of solar inactivity. Now, traditionally, what this does is make Earth cooler. This could be the reason that um, climate change, global warming, has plateaued for the last 10 years because this has gone on. Or they could be independent of each other. But we can't escape the fact that the sun has been very strange lately. And many solar <laughs> experts are uh, thinking that maybe this is the beginning of a prolonged period of uh, solar quiescence. We had one such that started in 1645 and lasted until 1715, where the sunspot cycle stopped completely. And all those sunspots stopped. And Earth got cold, and uh, colonies in Greenland and other places that had been farming communities uh, were forced to die out, flee, or just simply uh, die. The English Channel had icebergs. The canals of Venice froze, things that nobody had ever seen before. And here in the colonies, it was uh, periods, winters of extraordinary cold. And it was during that whole human lifetime, 1645 to 1715. Nobody knows why that happened. It's called the Maunder Minimum. And some are thinking that, well, now we've been 15 years into this very quiet period. It's not as deep as the Maunder Minimum, but it looks like an extended period of, of solar Quiescence, yes. Uh, you know the many ice age that happened during like the eighteen seventeen hundreds. 
Uh, was that caused by that? Well, which things are you talking about? The question well, is, were they, they, they caused uh, by that? You know, our, we, we humans love to match things with other ma things. That's what we do. So whenever, and we've got thousands of things, economic downturns, diseases, cycles of, uh, of um, earthquakes and lesser earthquakes, and what matches up with the sun's cycle. When we look for matches, of course, we're going to find them. For example, the rabbit population of Australia seems to march in sync with the solar cycle. The height of women's skirts in fashion. The party that controls Congress. I'm not kidding. But most of these things we consider to be uh, coincidence. So separating coincidence from correspondence, what really is being caused, we only have a couple of dozen cycles to match. This current one is called um, cycle number 24. So we haven't had a lot, and we have thousands of potential things to match with it. So we're going to find a lot of matches that don't really correspond. It's kind of a tricky business. One thing that it does is the northern lights. Now, I know some of you have seen beautiful displays of the aurora borealis, haven't you? Because um, here in Connecticut, if you get out to the countryside, uh, you'll see them from time to time. But we have not had a good one since 2001. And the main reason is we've had such a deep period of solar minimum. So th these spots, these storms that you're seeing are because the sun activity has increased now, but it still hasn't increased to what we normally expect. Yes? You mentioned that um, it's only about 15 years ago that we discovered that there's a core, a second sun. Yes. Um, and how did we discover that? I mean, it's so many miles away. And right. How did, you, how did science learn that? No, well, that's a great question. One of the ways is through helioseismology, that new field of studying the pulsations on the sun. The other is through the theory. You know, we started in 1920, Arthur Eddington's work that showed us why the sun <laughs> is hot. This was a big thing, because nobody could figure out why you have this ball, this is a million times larger than Earth by volume, that still continues to shine. It's calculated that if it were a ball of coal of that size, it would burn out in 2,000 years. So there has to be something going on other than burning. And so it was only then that we discovered what's called the proton-proton cycle that shows us nuclear fusion, changing hydrogen to uh, helium. And so since then, we've learned newer and newer things. For example, we found the sun puts out these tiny particles called neutrinos as part of its uh, core, which then travel almost at the speed of light. They don't get slowed down by the sun. The other stuff the sun produces, photons, bits of light, take up to a million years to squirm. Well, the usual estimate is more like 100,000. Some say as little as 15,000. Some say as long as a million years. A big estimate variation there. To squirm from the center of the sun to the edge and then escape. These things fly right out. And uh, one trillion neutrinos goes through each of your fingernails per second. And I don't mean that it, they just go through fingernails and no, no other parts of your body. You knew that. It's hard to get a laugh here in this group. I know the trying. <laughs> but we didn't know about those. So we're still learning about um, new things about the sun. Can you imagine that? It's the most prevalent particle in the universe, neutrinos, and nothing stops them. By day, they come down from the sun, they fly right through your body, and then go right through the Earth in a 20th of a second and out the other side. Right now at night, an equal number goes through your body, having first gone through the Earth without even being slowed down in the slightest, and then passing through your body from the ground up, and then exiting your head and going through uh, space. They're absolutely everywhere, you know, like roaches in, in Rio. And we never even knew about them until uh, the 1930s. So it's been a slow process of learning what's going on in the sun. And this is just a part of that. Still a lot of mysteries. Yes? You said that uh, December 7th was our darkest afternoon. So we experienced this the darkest day. Is it always December 7th? Yes. It can oh, vary so by I'm one birthday. day just because of the calendar and whether there's leap years, how many leap years. But it's usually Pearl Harbor Day, yes. It means I was born on the darkest day. Do you think that has any meaning? <laughs> well, the, the positive spin on that is that as soon as you were born, it got lighter. Yeah. Things started getting lighter. 
Yeah, birthdays are always interesting like that. I once did a thing in a group that, have you heard this thing statistically that if you have 24 people in a group, you have an even chance of a shared birthday? You wouldn't think this would be the case because 365 potential birthdays. But in a group of this size, it's a definite that there are two or more people, and probably more than that, that share the same birthday, even though there's way more than 365 people. I'm so tempted, if we have time to kill, we go through and have uh, people announce their uh, birth dates. And who are they? We wonder who are they. Yes? of radiation per year and some of that could cause, cause, cause cancer although usually not what, how much of that some of that is from uh, uranium and radon from the, from the earth how much is from cosmic rays and how much is from the sun and you've alluded to that with gamma rays and x-rays could you good, elaborate no good question I, I'm the old fashioned head that still thinks in terms of millirems more like 300 okay. millirems but same, same thing that you're saying same thing so the radiation, uh, it's true that this is natural stuff that you get all the time. And uh, the higher up you live, the more you get, because the less atmosphere is above your head, blocking cosmic radiation. Now this was discovered by uh, Victor Hess back, uh, we're talking about almost a century now, who flew hot air balloons um, and discovered that in what was the predecessor of the Geiger counter, as you went up higher, there was more radiation. And this made no sense because you're farther from the sources of, as you say, radon. Some of our basements have radon. And as you, it didn't make sense, and yet it turns out to be true. So space has cosmic radiation. First of all, cosmic rays, you mentioned them. Those are, bewilderingly enough, mostly protons, the heavy uh, nucleus of atoms. It doesn't make sense because there are just as many electrons in the universe as protons. So why are 90% of this incoming stuff from deep space protons? And because they're heavy, a proton weighs 1,836 times more than an electron, they pack, pack a wallop when they hit you. So it's not entirely um, benign. And you can tell it's happening because if you take it, your camcorder, you've got a good camcorder, go into a dark closet, Look at the screen, you'll see little flashes here and there. Those are actual cosmic rays or protons hitting the CCD detectors. It comes in at all times. Now, the sun also puts out um, broken bits of atoms, uh, typically flying at about 300 miles per second, discovered in the 1950s by Gene Parker. He called it a solar wind. And in the great tradition of science, he was ridiculed. People said, yeah, right, a wind comes from the sun, sure. But the first Earth satellite showed, yep, he was absolutely right, that, that there was a constant bombardment from these subatomic particles. And then with the wisdom of hindsight, everybody went, well, of course, that's why comet tails always point away from the sun. They're like airport wind socks. The solar wind blows them so the tails always point away from the sun. Now, of course, we should have thought of that. But this solar wind is like a guardian for us because this uh, um, creates a little bubble around the solar system that blocks many of the stronger cosmic rays from coming in. Bottom line here is that during a time of solar maximum, like now, more uh, radiation comes from the sun, but less gets in from um, deep space. So it's like a, a balancing job back and forth. And I once had that figure in my head of every 500 feet you climb, you get an extra, I think, five millirems of radiation. So that people in Denver, for example, living 5,000 feet up, get uh, significantly more radiation than we do. Oddly enough, though, surveys show that people who spend their whole lives high up, like um, Peruvians and Tibetans do not have higher rates of cancer. So that's strange. Especially considering that people whose occupation does take them high, like uh, flight attendants and um, crews of uh, lifelong pilots, commercial pilots, do have a 1% higher rate of cancer than the rest of us. Their, their lifelong risk is 23 
cases per 100 instead of 22 for the rest of us because they spend so much time going up. And one of your big sources of radiation in your life from the sun is uh, airline travel. So the big ones are, air, are actually radon, if you have radon, and uh, some things you can't help. It's horrible. Like a banana. You know that eating one banana, because bananas have a little bit of radioactive potassium in them, eating a single banana gives you the same radiation as living next door to a nuclear power plant for a year. Which sounds worse than it is, because actually, actually nuclear power plants have almost no radiation. <laughs> you, you get more radiation from coal fire plants, because coal ash uh, naturally contains some, uh, some radiation. So it sounds worse than it is, but still, whoa, you know? And nowadays, as I understand it, the major source has become CAT scans, anyway. A single full-body CAT scan can give you the same radiation that Hiroshima survivors got when they, if they were just a mile or two from ground zero. One whole body CAT scan. So it used to be that the main source of radiation was, was radon for people to have that in their basements. Now it's really CAT scans. So probably not a bad idea to ask your doctor if he's ordering one, whether a regular x-ray might not do just as well. Yep. That's, that's really relatively minor. There's minor sources like smoke alarms and like um, watches and those old-fashioned TV um, screens. They all had a little, small amounts of radiation. As I say, uh, nuclear power, uh, coal-fired plants. There's, there's very, very minor sources that epidemiologists uh, debate whether they produce any harm at all. There's a threshold below which there's no harm. The biggies are really... Um, uh, radon and uh, CAT scans, or uh, the next after that would be travel. If you go to uh, one flight to LA and back, uh, we'll give you about uh, six millirems of radiation. Yeah? I don't even know how to ask this. Uh, you mentioned that things are... Well, ask it in there first. Well, you mentioned that um, in the perception on Earth, everything is upside down to some extent, or I don't, I'm not putting that very well, but... I, it had to do with an upside-down effect of perception. Can you will, uh, talk about yeah, that? Yeah, the question is about the upside-down perception because our lenses, just like any lens, focuses images upside down in the back of our eye. We don't see the world upside down because we're totally used to that. Our brain translates that, and we see things the way we perceive them. So that's not a problem. I understand that, that uh, interesting experiments where people had to wear glasses that reversed everything, made it upside down so that they felt they were walking on the ceiling, that people actually get used to that in relatively short order and then now perceive the world in a completely different way. So that's no problem. The big amazing thing is, uh, is uh, this business, like in uh, the Royal Astronomical Society's handbook in Canada every year, Roy Bishop always writes that rainbows occur strictly within our skulls. You know, wild stuff. I mean, they're a little marginal anyway. You know, they're fairy tale, whether they're real. Because the person next to you sees a different rainbow than the one that you're seeing. They're not actual real objects. For example, a rainbow uh, can't cast a reflection. Or let's put it this way, if you see a rainbow and its reflection, you're actually seeing a reflection of a different rainbow. So you can't see a rainbow and its reflection. They, don't ca they can't cast shadows. Another proof that they're not real objects is that they appear as perfect um, semicircles, a perfect circle. And you know that in real life, the only object that's always going to be a, a circle from any angle is a sphere. But a rainbow is not a uh, light that's on the surface of a sphere. So there's a lot of different proofs. And I'm, again, I'm not being clever and saying, well, it's all in your head, and even a tree isn't really there. No, if you look at a tree or a traffic light, each of us sees it from a different angle, and we see it different ways. But a rainbow, you can't see it a different way. One interesting thing, next time you see a rainbow, this is not rainbow season. They're seasonal. We see them in the summer and preferentially in the afternoons after 4 o'clock 
in the summer because the rainbow requires sun and rain. And in the summer, we tend to get those puffy cumulus clouds. So it's much more likely to get a sun shower. This time of year, unfortunately, we get overcasts and we don't really get rain from separate puffy clouds that much. Next time you look at a rainbow, um, number one, you know what's in the center of every rainbow? I'm always amazed people don't know this. Every rainbow is a circle or a semicircle. Every circle has a center. What's in the center of every rainbow? All right, I'll tell you. It's the shadow of your head. Mark, marks the center of every rainbow. The other thing to look for is that outside, above every rainbow, the sky is darker than anywhere else. It's a very cool phenomenon called Alexander's Dark Band. Sounds like the song. The 1920s, I guess, or 30s song, Alexander's Dark Band. Name for it. Not that Alexander, but Alexander of Aphrodisias. And a good fact on a date to point out to people. Okay, he's got, this would be the point when they would have gotten the hook back in the days of vaudeville. <laughs> so let me ask the founder of our company and my boss, should we keep going with questions? Is there, uh, is there more of a, uh, well, let me see hands. Uh, is somebody's, anybody's question not answered? Yes, okay, you, sir. We'll take a few more. Um, could he say that into the uh, microphone? Does Stonehenge actually give accurate astrological, astronomical information, information and, and, and how? So, how well, does it do that? Right. Well, you know, the, the best person to ask would be the woman who was just there uh, recently. And you went to the visitor center, and don't these stones mark the rising and setting positions of the sun and the moon and uh, some particular stars? You know, the different cultures had different focuses. The Maya for example, were, were obsessed with Venus. So they would put monuments and pyramids aligned with that. The Egyptians simply loved north, south, east, west. The Great Pyramid is um, aligned within one degree, a perfect north, south, east, west, with the main passageway pointing towards uh, Polaris, the North Star. So cultures throughout history were aware of the sky. It's a little sad that because of our light pollution and all the rest. That's one of the reasons for SLU, is that we know that people have light pollution and they can't do astronomy. So we want to make it easier and bring uh, astronomy to them. In other words, we're kind of given up. You know, if we're going to uh, have the technology, let's use the technology to bring the, uh, bring the universe back to them. Let's take uh, just one or two final questions and we'll wrap it up. Over, over there, or are you just yawning? <laughs> I was just wondering if you do decide to join SLU, which I'm now thinking, oh, this sounds sort of interesting. So what, what, do, you, what do you actually get to do? That's so oh, for SLU? Yeah. It's very easy. If you go to SLU.com, S-L-O-O-H, you can see how it's spelled, .com, and uh, there'll just be places. There's memberships. There's different uh, types of memberships. I like the one where you can actually control the telescopes. I mean, can you imagine, right from your home, you do the screen, and then let's say you want to see Jupiter up close or a galaxy in full color. And this um, patented proprietary, I guess that's the right word, technology, allows in just five minutes of these giant telescopes looking there to get a full color detailed image of anything in the, uh, in the universe. So you can get a menu up, and it'll show you a couple hundred things that are out that night or any night that you want to do it. It'll show you whether it's free or not, whether other members are using it, and it's free more times than you'd think. And then you'd say, okay, 10 o'clock on Tuesday, let's look at Jupiter and see its red spot and see its moons that go around it. And then you press that and you made the reservation. And at that time, the telescope actually slews there, goes there, and you have it on your computer screen, and you keep it as a photo, use it as a screensaver, send it to your friends. And all other members of SLU sees what the other members are doing. And it's not, I, I like that it's not a committee, because that would produce fights, wouldn't it? It, it? It's not like everyone has to get together and decide, all right, what are we going to look at tonight? No, each member makes a reservation, <laughs> and the telescope goes there. That, that's how it's done. One last question about anything astronomical. OK, so let's review. Oh, you, you yes. 
Um, this isn't really a question. You'd made a comment about how the people in Peru you would think um, would be getting cancer more because of their uh, altitude. My thought is that it's they've over generations they've adapted to that environment and and therefore whatever they've developed they they don't is is a reason why they don't get cancer. Is but my that's logical. That sounds good to me. All right, so let's review what's coming up. We've got the great total solar eclipses, really rare, coming up on August 21st, 2017, and then April 8th of 2024. That's the greatest event. We have the Aurora Borealis, even around here, or you can come to Alaska and see it, or we'll bring it to you, or go to slu.com, and what we do there is uh, show you what events are coming up that we're going to cover and uh, bring to you on the screen. And those are always free. You don't even have to pay anything to <laughs> take part of those. And then you'll have, uh, while it's going on, you'll have some idiot or another narrating it. Usually me. <laughs> but also experts from around the world who are not idiots. Really, uh, we have like uh, solar astronomers and other people that are, uh, that are tops in their fields. So I see the restless of the group. It's, sol we're post it's the post-solstice syndrome. <laughs> A previously unknown affliction, medical affliction. So I'm going to let you guys go. Enjoy your dinner. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm an artist. I did a painting where the earth is on top.
NPR's Weekend Edition. Bob founded the Catskill Astronomical Society in 1976, the Storm King Observatory at Cornwall, New York, and Overlook Observatory near Woodstock, New York. And he was adjunct professor of astronomy and physics at Marymount College from 1995 to 2000. Bob lectures for innumerable academic and federal entities and as a slew live commentator, and also does large expeditions three times a year to celestial events such as auroras and also total eclipses. He has spent five years overseas from the Arctic to the Antarctic and is known for his unique blend of humor, mm. informality, and encyclopedic knowledge. Please join me in welcoming Bob Berman and SLU. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I appreciate that uh, generous introduction, even if I did write most of it myself, actually. Uh, this is very special because in the olden days, as many of you know, uh, just uh, these people I was just speaking to have just been to Stonehenge. And I don't have to tell you that Stonehenge is exemplative of the, of the, uh, the cultural celebrations of the solstice through the centuries, through the millennium. It was, uh, it was a big, big deal, not just because people had more time on their hands than they do today, but because, well, we'll talk about why, because. But it's fallen into um, kind of disuse, if that's the right word. Um, part of it is that some of those celebrations involved things that would be illegal today or frowned on, like animal sacrifices or throwing your in-laws from, from the tops of pyramids and things like that. It would violate municipal ordinances today. Nonetheless, uh, come on in, plenty of seats. At a certain point, I do this mischievous thing that really late comers, just as they come and I say, and that's the most important thing that we're going to, that you're going to hear today. And they feel, oh, what did I miss? I'll try to uh, keep myself from doing that. So around the world, this has been a self- Make it usable by NASA. Well, I knew right away we didn't have anybody on the library staff that was going to write that software. <laughs> However, because we got a grant about two years, oh no, a little over a year ago, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we had hired a maker in residence, Ed Kalin, who's here tonight, who did um, an, an open public experiment creating Raspberry Pi all-sky view cameras. And I knew as the MIT grad and also as the co-founder of the Fairfield County Makers Guild that he probably could do it. And he came to the meeting, and sure enough, not only did he work with Mike and Space Gambit and a person from Hawaii who was involved in this, um, they got the grant for $14,000, and he's writing the software um, to interface with NASA. But during that great conversation, it was decided that wouldn't it be nice to have a live slew event from the library? And so th it, that idea was hatched that day. So it's my pleasure to inter introduce to you our host, now, if you are an astronomer, you, this man does not need an introduction. But I know there are many of you in the audience, like me, who are not citizen scientists. So I'm going to do a, a smaller introduction. He has an incredible resume. But Bob Berman um, has authored more than 1,000 published articles in national magazines. He's been a guest on such TV shows as Today and Late Night with David Letterman. And he's written eight popular books. And one of them, we were just upstairs looking at the makerspace, and one of them was displayed, and it's the sun's heartbeat, which is very relevant for the winter solstice. And that one is upstairs um, on display with other winter solstice books. That's the most important one. Mm -hmm. um, he has a new book called Zoom, How Everything Moves from Atoms and Galaxies to Blizzards and Bees, published by Little Brown. And it's currently the Amazon number one bestseller in geophysics. For the past, past decade, he has been the chief astronomer for SLU, this community observatory. Since 1989, Bob is a popular monthly columnist in the magazines Discover and Astronomy. Listeners in seven states hear his Sky Window program on, on the Northeast public radio stations during...
about uh, 75 in the audience live, but we have many more who are watching this via a live stream on the internet. What is SLU? Well, the word SLU is not an acronym. Many people think that that S-L-O-O-H stands for something. The name SLU comes from the word SLU, S-L-E-W, which is a movement of a telescope to indicate that it is making that style of movement. But it was modified to O-O-H to express, express pleasure and surprise. Mm. Creative, SLU. SLU is a membership organization for amateur astronomers, also called citizen scientists, to explore, imagine, learn, and connect. Doesn't that sound like the library? <laughs> explore, imagine, learn, and connect. SLU is actually a robotic telescope service that allows members to have access to beautiful telescopes in the Canary Islands and in Chile. And you, they get access through their browser to these telescopes with a, with a very small membership fee. It's pretty amazing. SLU's headquarters is in Hartford. Now, you may wonder how this event came to be. About a year ago, SLU CEO, Michael Paolucci, asked if we might be interested in applying for a grant. And the grant was for creating a piece of software that would collect data that amateur scientists got when they were studying asteroids. And this software would take that data and Thank you. 